Lord of awesome wonders. Indeed, you show us much mercy than we deserve. We worship you, Father. We exalt you, Lord. And we say this morning, lift up your heads, O ye gates of the rose of Sharon, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory, the Onishe Yanu, may dwell with us. Father Lord, we bless you. We give you praise, Father Lord. You are the God Almighty, Jehovah Sabaoth, the mighty man in battle. We welcome you, Father. We welcome you, Son. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we have Worship. In Jesus' name we have worship. Let's jam our hands to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you, choir. Let's jam our hands together for the choir. Let's jam our hands together. Thank you, choir. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Ah, Sister Lara, you are welcome back. Hey. God bless you. <laughs> we give God praise. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this beautiful morning. Lord, as we go into your word, Father, I hide myself behind you. Take over, Lord. This morning, Lord, speak to destinies this morning. Shape destinies. Encourage those that need to be encouraged. Challenge those that need to be challenged. Father, do a work without hands in all our lives this morning. Take your place, Lord, and have your way. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Amen. Ah, ah. We sound like co-pop. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, some people have traveled, but those of us that are here, can we give God praise? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning. God bless you. It's good to be in church. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So this morning, the Lord has given us a word, and the word is in line with the Congress, the theme of the Congress. And I'm, actually, I'm quite excited. The word he's giving us for this morning is the great turnaround. The great turnaround. <laughs> oh, so I don't know how many of us watched the video. Maybe let's take a step back. How many of us even know that there's a there was a congress that took place last week in the redemption camp? One, two, three, only a few people. Ish. Okay, how many of us know the name of the church that we are sitting in? <laughs> Redeemed Christian Church of God. Rose of Sharon is just one parish out of many, many, many. So we had an international congress last week. Um, God made a way. I was privileged. I was able to attend the last few days. The theme of the Congress was the great turnaround. Amen. The great turnaround. Amen. And you know, the exciting thing, why I am excited, and why I was excited when the Lord said to share this, is just in the past one week, I got two texts from two members of the Rose of Sharon signifying the great turnaround. One sister in particular, it was her situation can be likened to the great turnaround. The second person, one of our mommies, I won't share her testimony, she would share it in the new year. Hers was the 11th hour miracle. How many of us were here when we, the Lord gave us a word, the 11th hour miracle? Uh, what's happening? Some of us have just been traveling. Only a few hands are here. Well, the Lord gave us a word a few weeks ago, the 11th hour miracle. And God is beginning to perform his word. What is the 11th hour miracle? This is not part. I haven't started to today's word. The 11th hour miracle is the one that comes just when the clock is on the 11th hour. And it doesn't mean in November. It just means, you know, the year is about to end. And the fact that you are here today, even if you were not here, you can still tap into that grace. If there are some people that are still cashing in and receiving their miracle before the year ends, you also can receive yours. And if you have the faith, the great turn around. Amen. The Lord has said we should talk about the great turn around this morning. Amen. Only Brother Amora is interested in the great turn around. Rose of Sharon, are we excited to be in the house of the Lord? If you are, let's shout one big hallelujah to the King of Kings. Okay, now we've just, it looks like we've just come in now. Praise the Lord. So the video advert for the Congress was beautiful. It was a wretched lady, and I'll tell you the story for those who haven't seen it. It was a short script of a wretched lady who, I mean, life had handed her a tough one. And she kept going to the house of a certain woman of God to ask for money. Each day she would go, she would knock on the door, she would beg for food. And the woman would give her food. And this particular day, she came in the door, you know, she knocked on the door again. This time, the woman was getting ready to scream at her. She was like, ah, I've done enough. I've done enough. I'm not ready to help you today. And when she opened the door, she got a beautiful surprise. She saw a beautifully dressed lady 
come in and she was like, it was the same woman. She almost didn't recognize her. And she was inviting her to the Congress, saying, the same God who turned my life around will turn yours around too. And she invited her to the great turnaround. That was such an interesting, a beautiful um, advert. And God is going to turn around somebody's life in the rose of Sharon. God has already started turning around the lives of some, some members. So as I said to you, a sister sent me a text. I won't tell you how. I said one person, her testimony was 11th hour test, uh, miracle. The second person, I can liken her testimony to that woman who in the past one year, she's been crying out to God about a certain thing and being careful not to say too much. But in the last one week to 10 days, God did a turnaround. God did a turnaround that surprised her so much. Somebody here will also receive a great turnaround in the name of, the, in the name of Jesus. Why? Because that's the word that was given to our Father and the Lord, the great turnaround. And I'm going to share the story of something that happened at camp as um, God used it as a symbol. On Friday, Friday is the Holy Ghost night. That's the day that has the largest attendance. During the Holy Ghost night, the lights went off for a few minutes. And then the lights came back on again. And guess what had happened? A serpent had gone up the electric, the, the, the light, the electric, uh, what's it called? The pole for power. And the serpent got electrocuted. And while it went up, obviously that's why there was a power cut. But what happens when anything human, anything that has life is electrocuted? What happens? Does it still live? It was dead. And the word that the Lord gave our Father and the Lord was to tell the redeemed Christian church of God, the serpent is dead. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, the serpent is yeah. dead. <laughs> so that, that God allowed that serpent to go up. That serpent, you know, it could have done all sorts of things. What would have happened if he had gone into the crowd? You don't want to imagine that. But instead it went up. He put off the lights. There was darkness for a short time. But the serpent was electrocuted. Tell somebody else, the serpent is dead. That was the word that God gave our Father and the Lord. And he said this word, this is a symbol for every member of the redeemed Christian church of God. That serpent, and we know the great serpent signifies the devil, who it is that resists God's children. And God was saying this is the symbol of the great turnaround. The serpent is dead. Tell yourself this time, the serpent is dead. <laughs> so we're going to look at Psalm 126, verses 1 to 6. Yes, the serpent so troubling your life and mine is dead. You are not saying it with confidence, eh? If God could go to the extent of using a life example of a serpent going up the pole, and the lights went out in the... Maybe to just let you know, the... the, the the numbers that are in the Congress, ah, in the past Congresses, they have run to three, four, five million. So just to let us know that when we talk about a serpent going up and lights going off in an environment where there are so many multitudes of people, it is a serious thing. But God then causes an electrocution of that demonic thing. I've, I would expect that would be more accepted. Tell yourself, the serpent troubling my life is dead. We're going to look at Psalm 126, from 1 to 6. When the Lord turned around, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Amen. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Amen. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, the Bible is so real. The fact that it says that the, he that goeth forth, and weepeth. And he says, those that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He's telling you that God is acknowledging that there will be periods in our lives where we will sow in tears. But he's saying that you may go through that period when you sow in tears, but you will reap in joy. Yeah. You will reap in joy, Rose of Sharon. Yeah. This morning, for those who are not here, we talked about the journey from Mara to Elim. We said that Mara comes before Elim. 
Elim signifies abundance, it signifies fruitfulness. It signi we, we liken to it to a place like Bahamas, like Seychelles, like Mauritius, whereas Mara is a place of bitterness. But we mentioned this morning, I'm not preaching the sermon. We mentioned this morning that Mara is on the way to Elim. So for some people, maybe this year you have been to Mara. Maybe this year you have faced bitter situations. The Lord was encouraging us in the first service that Mara is on the way. It is but a stop on the way to Elim. Trust God that no matter what, as you are going, if you have gone through Mara, or you've been through Mara, or you feel that you are still in Maria, you will get to Elim. And know that even that Elim is not the destination. Canaan was the destination. Rose of Sharon, you will reach your destiny in the name of Jesus. So perhaps you've been coming to the house of the Lord sowing seeds of weeping. The Lord will grant you a great turnaround. He is faithful, like he did for the sister we mentioned, like he did for the woman of God, the other person who we mentioned, he will do the same for you. So let's look at the story of Ruth and Naomi very quickly. Ruth, we're going to read, I'll, I'll read one, uh, Ruth chapter 1, 1 to 5, um, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. So who was Ruth and who was Naomi? There was a family in Israel there, God's, uh, El Elimelech was the husband, Naomi was his wife. They were from Bethlehem in Judah. And the time came when there was a famine in, in the land of Israel. And Bethlehem is in Judah. Judah, we know, is one of the 12 tribes. There was a famine. And Elimelech, we said it this morning, Elimelech decided to go down to Moab. God didn't send him there. I don't believe that God led him there. But anyway, so let's read verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home, and he went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. The two sons, he had two sons, they were Marlon and Chilion. They were Ephraphites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. <laughs> then Elimelech died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Opa, and the other married a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Marlon and Chilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. So let's look at a little bit of the background. First of all, Naomi means pleasant or amiable. Mara represents bitterness. We talked about that this morning. Marlon means sickness. I don't know why a person will name their child sickness. Chilion means consumption. And Ruth talks about beauty. So just something that's just a little bit of jara, if I ever use the word jara. Jara is the extra on the <laughs> when the woman in the market is selling. A little bit of jara, which is not part of the sermon for some people here. Please, when you name your babies, give them names that signify a glorious destiny. Don't give them names like sickness and names like consumption and names like obituary and names like failure. Some people are laughing because those names exist. And some people, their fathers, their parents give them good names and then they get to call college and they give themselves stupid names. There was once a man, Mary. So please give your children good names. And if it's you that's giving yourself a name, give yourself a good name. I thought more than one person would say amen to that. So let's go back to our story. So Elim Elimelech moved his family to Moab, a heathen nation. So let's look at that. Elimelech was an Israelite from Bethlehem in Judah. <laughs> Judah was in the times of the judges, a time when people did as they pleased, a time when Israel kept sinning against the Lord. So when famine came upon the land, famine very likely was promised in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, that when God's children sin, famine will come upon the land. So famine came upon the land. And then Elimelech decided to move to Moab. Ha! Let's look at the background of Moab. Who are the Moabites? First and foremost, Moab and Ammon resulted from an ancestral relationship that Lot had with his children. His children got him drunk. Lot was Abraham's nephew. His children, his daughters got him drunk. They slept with him, and that was the beginning of Moab and Ammon. So first of all, Moab is not a nice place to go to because Moab is a nation that, you know, comes from an ancestral, ancestral relationship. They were one of the tribes in Canaan, they, in, in, in the land before Israel came in, and they worshipped other gods. They worshipped a god called Chemosh, and that god they used to 
you know, sometimes sacrificed their children to. So they were like a heathen nation that God did not, God was not pleased with. Then the second thing about Moab is when Israel left the promise, when they left um, Egypt and they were going to the promised land. If we recall the story, as they were going on the way, they tried every so often they would get to some of these heathen lands. And Moses would send a, an entourage and say, please allow us to just pass through your land. We won't take anything. We won't fight with you. Moab is one of those countries. But guess what? Moab said, no, we're not going to allow you in. And God was very angry. And then the third thing that, that made Moab an abomination to God was they ordered or they hired a man called Balaam to curse God's children. But God turned the curse into a blessing. And so because of that, God said in Deuteronomy 23, 3 to 5, An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Peor of Beor from Peth of Mesopotamia to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. So so Moab was a nation that God abhorred for all these reasons. First of all, they came from an incestuous relationship. But you know, God is a merciful God. But as if that wasn't bad enough, they were descendants of Lot, who was Abraham's grandchild. So God was one who was always saying, look after your people. So even though they were not Israelites, they were still related to the Israelites. And yet they had the audacity to say, no, you can't come. We can't give you bread. We can't, you can't pass. So God was very angry. Then they went to the worst. They ordered, they hired somebody to curse Israel. So God said, uh-uh, for 10 generations, no Moabite will come near me. Now, this is now the context for you to understand. This is now the nation that Elimelech decided, I'm going to Moab when there was, when there was famine in the land. Do you think that that was a good decision? No, clearly the Lord could not have led him. And so sometimes we make decisions and then we face the consequences of our decisions. And then we say, God is not, God is wicked to me. But in actual fact, maybe we ourselves have, have done some things. But God is still a merciful God. Anyway, so in the midst of that, uh, Elimelech went to Moab. First he died, consequence obviously of the wrong decision. Then his first son died. Then his second son died. And what was the result of that? Naomi was widowed and she lost all her sons. So she actually said, please call me Mara. Don't call me Naomi. Because the Lord has dealt a heavy blow on me. She was blaming God, even though it wasn't God's fault. So Elimelech moved his family to Moab, a heathen nation. And because of that, his, his family suffered the consequences. Now, remember, we're talking about the great turnaround. Remember that the, the video I told you about was a lady whose life was wretched, and God turned her life around, gave her a new story, a new life, a new job, everything, turned her life around. Now, Naomi started from the top with her husband and her sons. Her sons got married. They got married to Ruth and, and Opa, and suddenly... Her husband died. She was widowed. Now, in Israel, it was not really, there wasn't really good provision for widows. Widows tended to suffer quite a bit. So God actually made a, 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 like a leverate law for, law for them, whereby if a woman lost her husband, the brothers of the, of any of the brothers of the husband could marry the woman so that she'd be provided for. But we'll come back to that. So, uh, Naomi was now in a situation where she had lost everything. There was no more hope. And she and Ruth and Opa now decided, we've suffered enough in this land. Let's go back to Israel. Let's go back to Bethlehem, which is where Naomi and Elimelech came back from, came from. And then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, as they were going on the way, Naomi said, you know what, Ruth and Opa, go back to your Moabite family. I can't, I, my sons who married you are dead. I can't provide husbands for you. Even if I give birth to children now, are you going to wait for them and marry them? And so she said, please go back. And Opa said, okay, bye, I love you, I leave you, I'll go back to my people so I can get another husband. Ruth said, mm -mm, I will stay with you. <laughs> and she just chose to embrace the God of Naomi. So let's look at Ruth chapter 1, 14 to 18. This is the point where uh, Naomi had said to Ruth and Opa, please go back. The Bible says us, tells us they wept together. Opa kissed her mother-in-law and she said, bye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi and she said, look, 
Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to your people and her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. You know, this story just comes very simply. It seems like, ah, how come? But just in a nutshell, remember that the Moabites were a heathen nation. Ruth was from a heathen nation. But she chose to embrace the God of Israel. She chose to follow Naomi. Obviously, Naomi was have shown her by her life that she, that the God that she was serving was really the living God. And this isn't part of the sermon, but I just want to ask us here to look inwards. What does my life reflect to people around me? Will people see me and want to serve my God? Ne and it doesn't have anything to do with whether you go through challenges or not, eh? Naomi went through the worst challenges. She lost her husband and she lost her sons. But in spite of all that, Ruth still chose to follow Naomi, which means several things. One, it means that Naomi's life was such a demonstration of God's love, despite the bitterness she was going through, despite the pain Naomi had, as, as, as we talked about during the workers' meeting, she had a close walk with God. And Ruth watched and saw that, ah, I better, I'm better off with this God of Israel. I'm better off with this mother-in-law who has demonstrated so much love and the love of God. And she chose to go with her. So Naomi returned to Israel, poverty-stricken, widowed, broken, hopeless, and bitter. Perhaps some of us can identify with that. You may not have lost husband. You may not have lost child. God forbid. But you may have faced circumstances that have made you feel poverty-stricken, or widowed, or broken, or hopeless, or bitter, whatever it was. So when Naomi and Ruth got back to Bethlehem, Ruth 120, listen to what Naomi said. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? The only thing about this, though, is that she was blaming God. Remember what we said from the beginning. Was it God's fault? No, it wasn't. It was her husband's decision. Her husband did not seek God's face. Her husband decided, I'm going to Moab. It could not have been God's choice. Sometimes we face the consequences of our choices, but despite that, God is merciful. So even in her bitterness, even in her pain, Naomi still trusted God. She expressed her pain. She was honest, but she still trusted God. So when they got back, the Bible tells us, I just cut, you know, the, the previous verse to 20 tells us that everybody in Bethlehem came out and was welcoming Naomi and Ruth. Clearly, Naomi's husband was well known. He was wealthy initially. He was well known. She lost her husband. She lost her sons. She returned to Bethlehem broken, desolate, hopeless, and bitter. She even changed her name to Mara, as we said. It tells us how painful her circumstances were. Naomi blamed God, even though that wasn't right. She blamed God for allowing her to lose her husband and two sons. But as we're going to see now, we will see how God made a great turnaround. And that's why we're talking about this this morning. It doesn't matter how low your situation may be. It doesn't matter how bad it may be. If Naomi's situation could be so bad that she'd lost husband and two children, that she could say, please change my, my name is now Mara, it's no longer, which means bitterness, my name is no longer Naomi. It means that she was really, she had really been through a tough time. But we see the fourth point now is that God orchestrates the stage for a great turnaround. When we're in a difficult situation, know that as we said this morning for those who are here, these are phases. In life, there are times when we will go through valley situations. There are times when we will go through mountain situations. Valley situations are painful situations. And that's what Naomi went through. But in it all, when you go through those valley situations, let your trust still be in God. Let your hope be in him. No matter how painful you may be going through in that situation, no matter how painful that situation is, no matter how bitter that situation is, let your trust still be that God can still make a way. And God will still make a way. There will still be a great turnaround. So this God who cares for our pain, he began a turnaround. And he will do the same for you and I. So let's move to Ruth. Ah, that amen is very. 
So let's jump quickly to Ruth 2, 1 to 12. Now I'm going to move a bit faster because we need to do what the Lord said to do. So Ruth 2 from verse 1. Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem called Boaz. Hmm. He was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, remember, Ruth is Naomi's daughter-in-law. Ruth had lost her husband. They were both penniless. They had nothing. And so they came back and stayed in Elimelech's home, wherever it was. Um, so Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my dear, go ahead. Let me just tell you the culture in Israel. This was a rule that God gave. He gave that rule for the poor. Whenever it was a harvesting time, the rule that God gave is when you harvest your, your stalks, Always leave the corners. Don't harvest everything. Leave some so that the poor can come after and they can take something for free. Hello, are we still in the house? So this is, it was based on this culture. Naomi was not, uh, Ruth was not going to sit at home doing nothing. And maybe that's another question, which is not part of the word I want to ask. Sometimes when we go through these bitter situations, what do we do? Do we sit at home feeling bitter, waiting for God to change? Or do we get moving and do something? Ruth was not going to just sit on her backside and wait for something to happen. She went out there and she said, let me go out. She said to her mother, I will go out and let me see if I can harvest. And her mother-in-law said yes. Verse 3, so Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. And as it happened, she found herself walking in a field that belonged to Boaz. Remember Boaz, the Bible says, was a wealthy man. But not just that. He was the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. So while she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, and he greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, foreman, foreman who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she's a young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She has been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you, when, when you gather grain. Don't go to any other field. Stay right here behind, behind the young women walking in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. Let's just stop there. You think it's today that rape started? Hello? Or what do you think this is talking about? Or you think they'll just go and smile and touch her? He warned them, don't move near that woman. Hmm. So she had been, um, where are we now? What verse? Verse 9. Sorry, I'm not wearing my reading glasses. Okay, see which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. I have warned the young men. Oh, sorry. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I am only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied. But I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Perhaps there's somebody here that you feel desolate and abandoned, and you have gone to take refuge in the Lord. The Lord, the word of God says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. God's word is to somebody here. It says by the Spirit of the Lord, there's someone here who I can liken to Ruth, and you've gone to hide behind the Lord. You are looking up to the Lord in your situation. The Lord says to tell you, he will not fail you. He will not fail you. You will not be put to shame. So, Boaz then made a blessing for her. See this. Remember we said that Ruth was a Moabite. I don't need to re re repeat what I've said about the history of Moabite. They were a heathen nation. But she decided to leave the heathen nation. She decided to embrace the God of Israel. She decided to follow her mother-in-law, whom we said was an embodiment of the grace of God. And we asked ourselves, does my life, is my life such that somebody will see me and say, let me follow you to your God? Uh, you, don't, you don't need to tell me. You just think and answer and tell your God so he can help you. Each one of us needs to be able to answer that. So I'll jump to Ruth 3, 1 to 4. But let me just pause there. So what is happening here? Remember I said to you that there is a law in Israel. There was a law in Israel. 
whereby it was to provide for widows because widows ended to be pe- ended up being very like very often penniless like Naomi was. So God made this. There was this rule anyway in Leviticus, whereby if a man died, any of his brothers could marry the wife of the dead dead brother, and any child that they had would carry the name of his brother. It was to perpetuate the, the name of the family and also to provide for the widows. So Ruth got back with Naomi and she said, let me go and glean in the field. And they went and gleaned and she just so happened to glean. She just picked a field. We will say, man will say coincidence, but God was ordering her steps. She so happened to pick the field of Boaz, who the Bible says was a very wealthy man, but was also a relative of her late father-in-law. Do you see what is happening? God was setting, setting the stage for re- restoration and everything else for Naomi and Ruth. So Ruth 3, 1 to 4. Let me read that very quickly, then we'll, we'll talk about what God did. So one day, Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, it is time that I found a permanent home for you so that you'll be provided for. Remember what we said? for widows to be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours. He has been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now, do as I tell you. Take a bath. Put on perfume. Hello. It's the Bible we're reading. No, we're not reading Hello magazine. (laughs) See, the Bible is very practical. Some of us don't like to read our Bibles except on Sunday. It is very interesting and it's very practical. So she says, now do, this is verse 3. Now do as I tell you, take a bath, put on perfume, and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the, <laughs> go to the threshing floor. But don't let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. Hello, caution to the sisters. Please don't take this as a rule to say, let me go and find the husband I want. The Bible says, he that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor with the Lord. This was based on a culture in Israel at that time, a culture that provided for widows. That was what, <laughs> that was what Naomi was basing her direction to, to uh, Ruth on. Secondly, she knew that Boaz was a man of integrity. She knew that Boaz would not touch Naomi. Sisters, go on, don't go and put yourself in danger. Oh. Hello? Uh, you are not answering. Don't go and put yourself in danger oh, and say you are going to put yourself under somebody's blanket. <laughs> don't put yourself under somebody's blanket, please. <laughs> anyway, so Naomi gave um, Ruth these instructions. And what was happening here? Naomi wanted to find a husband for Ruth in Boaz, using the law of the Kingsman redemption. That's the one I said to you about, where a man is allowed to be a Kingsman redeemer, to marry a widow in his family. Um, So according to this law, a close relation was allowed to redeem the inheritance of of a dead brother, but was required to also marry the widow of the dead brother and raise up seed to sustain the widower's name in Israel. So Naomi gave Ruth certain instructions. One, wash and anoint herself with perfume. Two, get dressed for the occasion and go to the threshing floor at night where Boaz would be, would be guarding his harvest. Boaz had the reputation of being an honorable man who would do the right thing. So remember, I mentioned it that he would, Naomi knew he would walk in integrity. He wouldn't jump on Ruth. As a matter of fact, he even said to the men, don't touch her. Don't harass her. So he told her also to hide herself to the right time, then lie at his feet and wait for his instructions. I just feel led to tell some sisters here, sometimes a sister may feel led of the Lord, that this is the Lord. The Lord may show you that is your husband. But what you must do is what Ruth did. Wait until the right time. The husband will find you. Uh -uh, That amen is so quiet. Wait until the right time. The husband will find you. Even if you receive, you feel that, oh, God is saying to me, is this brother somewhere? Don't go and meet the brother and say, "Uh haven't you heard from God? (laughs) It's not like that, too. Just wait and allow him to find you. So as we round up this, Ruth 4, 9 to 10, Boaz marries Ruth. Um, So let me just tell you what happened in between. So Ruth obeyed uh, Naomi. She obeyed her mother-in-law, and she went, and she lay 
just at the foot of the, the, you know, where Boaz was sleeping. And then he woke up and found her and said, ah, who is this? And she said, it's me. Please stretch your blanket over me. Be, and, and that was significant. What she was saying is, be my kinsman redeemer. Now, this required humility. It required her humbling herself. It required her eating humble pie, if I may use that word. Because she also knew that Boaz could reject her. He could very well say, eh, eh, I can't be your kinsman redeemer. Then go and find somebody else. So she obeyed her mother-in-law. She lay there quietly. When Boaz realized, she said to him, stretch your blanket over me to be my kinsman redeemer. And then Boaz said, I will do that. However, there is a closer relative. He knew that was a law in Israel. But he said to her, there is somebody else who is closer to your husband. Let, us, uh, let me follow this up and I will come back to you. If he will be your kinsman redeemer, it means he will marry you. If not, then I will do the honors. And so let's see what he did. Uh, Ruth 4, 9 to 10. The boy said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, because he went to the city gate. The city gate in those days, you can liken to going to the hall, the town hall. And he said there, oh, and then he said to the people in the city gate, he said that Naomi is back. Naomi, the wife of the late Elimelech, is back. And um, we all know that Elimelech is dead. But now she has the property of Elimelech. And we need a kinsman redeemer to buy that property. And immediately the man that he was talking to said, oh, I will buy the property. Ah, Then Boaz said, no problem. But when you buy the property, you will inherit the wife of Marlon, whose name is Ruth. Because when Elimelech died, the property fell to her. And then the kinsman redeemer said, ah, no, it is for my inheritance. I can't marry her. <laughs> which was fine. God was orchestrating all this. So Boaz said, I will do the honors. So at the end of the day, Boaz, I won't bother to read that. I'm going to jump to verse 13. So Boaz said, I will do the honors. I will marry Ruth. See how God set the stage for Ruth to be sorted out. The Bible says in Ruth 4.13, so Boaz took Ruth into his home and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman of the town said to Naomi, praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast and she cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the grandfather of David. Hello. Can you see this is awesome? Very awesome. Naomi was the wife of Elimelech. Elimelech died. Elimelech made a mistake in going to Moab. He died, and his two sons who got married, the two sons also died. Naomi came back to Bethlehem, poverty stricken, hopeless, thinking there was no chance for her. Feeling like maybe some people are feeling now, needing a great turnaround. And then God began to set the stage. God set the stage by, first of all, making sure that Ruth followed Naomi. And God set the stage for a wealthy man called Boaz, a man of integrity, a man that was respected in the land. Uh-uh. Can you have done anything better for yourself? Hello, what's happening on this side? Could you have done anything better for yourself? God orchestrated things so that Boaz, a man who was well-respected, who was wealthy, is the one who now married Ruth. Now, not only is it that he married Ruth, they had Obez. And Obez is the father of Jesse, the grandfather of King David. And guess what? That person is in the genealogy of Jesus. God gave Ruth and Naomi such a great turnaround, an awesome turn around. God restored both of them beyond their expectations. Naomi thought she had lost everything. However, God gave her a daughter-in-law who gave her a son who is named in the genealogy of Jesus. Ruth left her country and her gods. She was broken. God gave her a, a great turnaround. This is a God who restores. He picks up our broken lives. When we are hopeless, when we are helpless, he turns around our captivity. The final point, God will do it again. If he did it for Naomi and Ruth, he will do it again for you. If he did it for the sister that I mentioned at the beginning of the word, he will do it for you, Rose of Sharon. He will do the same for you. And that's why he gave the word the great turnaround for this Congress 
for the Congress for this year. He knew that his children, many of his children have been through the fire this year. And he wanted to bring a great turnaround. And that's why that theme, that Congress was themed a great turnaround. And that's why he also gave a significant symbol with the serpent that was electrocuted. Tell somebody else beside you, the serpent that troubles my life is dead. And I will experience a great turnaround. So, what the Lord has said we should do, we're going to do this morning. What he said we should do this morning, I'm not giving an altar call. Because everybody needs a great turnaround. Hello, doesn't everybody need a great turnaround? Yes, so what the Lord has said to, we're going to do this morning, we're going to have five minutes. The altar is open. The only thing is you can't climb the step. If you want to, you can pray where you are. If you want to, you have five minutes, you can come to the altar and pour out your heart to the Lord. In five minutes, what is that thing that you need a great turnaround for? You can come to the front. The only thing I've said is you can't climb, but you can come to the altar. You can kneel at the altar. You can just pour your heart out to the Lord. Hello, Rose of Sharon. Or is it that nobody needs a great turnaround? So you may come forward. Those who want to come to the altar, the altar is open. You may come forward. I'm also going to just stay somewhere near the altar and just pour my heart out. We have five minutes to do this. And then we'll do what God said we should do. Just pour out your heart out to the Lord in that time. What is that thing you need a great turn around for? <laughs> it is that season now. And if you choose to stay where you are, you can stay where you are and pour your heart out to him.
You may begin to bring your prayers to an end. You may bring your prayers to an end. Eternal Rock of Ages, we thank you. Father, Lord, for your sons and your daughters who have come to the altar and those who have stayed where they are and have cried out, each one of us has cried out to you for a great turnaround. Father, Lord, you know those areas where people have looked up to you for. Father, like you did it for the two, two uh, sisters in the Rose of Sharon, like you did it, Father, for many others, you are able to do it. You are not a respecter of persons. Father, I decree into the life of everyone who has cried out today, Lord, that there will be a turnaround. There will be a great turnaround, even as you did. Father, you are the God that did think this, this for Naomi and, and, and Ruth. Father, in a situation where they were in total poverty, desolation, hopeless and helpless. You rose up on their behalf. For everyone who has cried out to you today, arise on their behalf. Lord, you are, the, you are our help, Father. Be the helper of the helpless. Where people have been sowing in tears, Father, I decree they will begin to reap in joy. Father, let there be a great turnaround in the name of Jesus. As our Father and the Lord has decreed, Father Lord, Father, we decree, Lord, that so it shall be in the lives of every member of the Rose of Sharon. There shall be a great turnaround. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we are prayed.